Okay, then let's start. Um, we still have a few orbitals to discuss. Um, so the last orbital that we discussed on Monday was the 3D Z square orbital. And uh, I've explained the shape of the 3D Z square orbital using the wave function for the 3D Z square orbital. And we have seen that, um, well, the 3D Z square orbital has its characteristic shape because of the, yes. Oh, we don't see anything. Um, yeah, I forgot that. Sorry about this. <laughs> All right, so we have uh, the angular part of the wave function. And uh, in Cartesian coordinates, it uh, basically gives you this equation here. And um, this equation here basically describes the shape of the cone. And therefore, we have a conical node. And because of that the conical node, we have, well, these two dumbbells here. And this case, we have the same algebraic sign. So there's a difference to the p orbital. And uh, this uh, toroidal ring, which has the opposite algebraic sign. So this 3 disease square orbital has two um, angular nodes. In this case, we have two conical nodes. OK. Um, then in addition, we have four more um, d orbits to discuss. So another one is the 3dx square minus y square orbital. You see here the respective uh, wave function. So the radial part of the wave function is exactly the same as for the uh, 3D square, but the angular part of the wave function is different, and therefore our orbit has a different shape. So what shape does it have? Well, again, we un understand this when we convert the angular part of the wave function from the uh, spherical polar coordinates to Cartesian coordinates. Then this function adopts uh, this form here, um, so our function is now a quarter times the square root of 15 over pi times x square minus y square over r square. So again, we need to think about well, what nodes um, are associated with this uh, angular part of the wave function. And in order to decide this, we need to determine under which conditions this uh, function here becomes zero. So essentially, it becomes zero when x squared minus y squared um, is equal to zero. Okay, so for which x and for which y values is this the case? We have again two possibilities. So the first possibility is that x is equal to y, and the second possibility is that x is equal to um, minus y. Okay. So now that again describes two planes. So we have again two planar nodes. And uh, these two uh, planar nodes um, uh, uh, lie in between the x and the, and the y axis. Okay, Only halfway is so at a 45 degree angle in between the x and the y axis. x is equal to y or x is equal to uh, minus y. Again, the z coordinate. Uh, <laughs> can be uh, can be anything. Therefore, the 
uh, two planes, they are oriented along the Z axis. So now, um, therefore our dx square minus y square orbital looks like this. We have actually four lobes, okay? And these four lobes are located on the axes, okay? And those that lie on the same axis have the same algebraic sign, okay? So here we have the y-axis, and we have these two blue lobes standing for negative sign. And here we have the x-axis and the two lobes that lie on the x-axis that have positive algebraic sign, okay? So these two lobes are divided by the two planar nodes which bisect the xy plane, okay, by a 45 degree angle. So now we understand uh, the shape of the 3D x square minus y square orbital. We actually also understand why it's called the 3D x square minus y square orbital. It is because the angular part of the wave function is a function of x square minus y square. Okay, now we have three more d orbits to consider. That's the 3D xy, the 3D yz, and the 3D xz. So again, the radial parts of the wave function are the same. Only the uh, angular parts of the wave function are different from the cases that we discussed previously. So um, I'm writing here directly the angular parts of the wave function in Cartesian coordinates. So for the 3 dyz, that function is a function of the product of y times z hence the name 3 dyz orbital. Again, if you want to understand the shape of this orbital, you need to think about um, under which conditions does that uh, function become zero and what are the associated nodes that result from that. So now for this function, um, there are again two possibilities. The first possibility is that y is equal to zero Okay, because zero times, well, uh, a product becomes, becomes zero. The other possibility is that z is equal to zero. So y is equal to zero describes an xz plane. Okay, so in an xz plane, y is equal to zero. And the other possibility describes uh, an xy plane. Okay, in in an x y plane, the z is equal to zero, and x and y can be can be verified. Okay, um, so therefore, um, our three d y z orbital has again four lobes. Okay, um, and um, we have well, two planar nodes separating these four lobes, the x uh, z plane, okay, the x z plane, uh, which is actually standing, standing here, okay, dividing these two and these two, and then there's of course the x y plane, okay, which basically separates this lobe from that lobe and that lobe from that lobe. All right, so wherever we have a node, Therefore, the algebraic sign of the wave function um, changes. Okay, now let's go to the 3D XZ. So the 3D XZ is a function of uh, the product of X times Z, as you can see from the equation here. So now, for which, um, under which conditions does that function become zero? Well, again, there are two possibilities. The first possibility is that X is equal to zero. The second possibility is that z is equal to zero. So x is equal to zero defines which plane? Can anybody tell? Y z? Yes, that's correct. And for z equal to z equal to zero defi is defined by which plane? The xz plane, uh, sorry, the xy plane, yeah? Um, so um, that again defines 
the shape of the orbiter. You see the shape of the orbiter is the same as previously. It's just that because the, the two planar nodes are in different positions, the orbital is, <clears throat> is, is oriented, oriented. Um, differently. So we have again the X Y plane here, which separates this node from that node and this one from that node. But then we have in addition to that, the uh, Y Z plane, which separates this lobe from that lobe and this lobe from that lobe over here. Okay. So last but not least, we have the 3D X Y. Okay, the 3D XY is a function of the product of X times Y. So this function becomes also zero under two possible conditions. The first condition is that X is equal to zero. And the second condition is that Y is equal to zero. So X is equal to zero describes now the YZ, the YZ plane and Y equal to zero describes the XZ plane, okay? Uh, therefore, our well, uh, orbit is again oriented differently. It now lies actually in the xy plane. Okay. And um, well, the um, nodes are actually on the well, uh, yz plane and on the xz plane. So at first glance, the 3D XY looks well, identical to the 3D X square minus Y square, which also lies in the XY plane. But actually the 3D XY is oriented uh, uh, by, 45, by a 45 degree angle relative to the 3D X square minus Y square. So the 3D X square minus Y square had the lobes lying on the axes Okay. And the nodes were in between the axes, while for the 3D XY, it's the opposite. Okay. So the nodes uh, lie on the uh, axes, and the lobes, they are in between the axes. Okay. So please keep that different difference in mind. It's, it's actually quite important for uh, chemical bonding. All right. So you see that for all the 3D orbitals, we have uh, two angular nodes. Sometimes these nodes are, are planar nodes, but they can also be conical nodes as we have seen for the 3D X square minus Y square, so for the 3D Z square. All right, so now we could extend this of course also to F orbitals, but I'm not going there because the principles are just uh, the same. Um, but at the end, I would like to show you that there's actually a simple correlation between the quantum numbers and uh, the number and the type of the nodes. One can cast this into uh, a few very uh, simple formulas. So the number of radial nodes is given by the formula n minus l minus one Okay, whereby n is the quantum number n and l is the uh, angular quantum number uh, l. And um, the number of angular nodes is uh, equal to the number, uh, quantum number l. Okay. And well, what's then the number of the overall nodes? Well, the number of the overall nodes is always um, n minus one. Yeah, so that's a one, not not an l. Okay. Um, so this was the subchapter about um, orbitals. Now let's shift our attention away from the shapes of the orbitals um, toward the energy of orbitals. And let's first consider again the hydrogen atom, but then go from the hydrogen atom to multi-electron atoms. So
so um, now let me just start the new presentation here. So first look, let's look at the orbital energies of the The hydrogen atom, okay. The solution of the Schrodinger equation also gives you the energy of the orbitals. And unsurprisingly, the results are the same as the results for the Bohr model. Okay, this is unsurprising <clears throat> because we saw that for the Bohr model, the energies of the electrons were in accordance with the atomic spectra. Okay, and so the energies of the electrons must have been right, okay? Therefore, the solution of the Schrodinger equation that gives you the orbitals should give you the same result and exactly it does give you the same result. So that, however, means that um, the energy of the, the orbitals um, is only a function of the quantum number n. Okay, remember for the Bohr atom model, the energy was only as, as the function of the quantum number n, and the same uh, is uh, true for the Schrodinger atom model. Okay, so this means that, um, well, the orbital which has the lowest energy is the Wannes orbital, and it, it's the same as well, what Bohr uh, calculated for the electron in the lowest orbit, it's minus 13.6 electron volts. Okay. So now as we go from the first shell, which is also called K shell to the second shell, um, in contrast to the Bohr atom model, we have more states allowed for the, for the second, for the second, uh, radius, so to say. So we have the 2s orbital to consider as well as the 2p orbital, okay? But for both orbitals, we get the same energy, okay? According to this formula, because according to this formula, the energy is uh, constant uh, over the quantum number in, in a square. So again, in that I would also like to point out this energy is a negative energy because it represents a binding energy. Okay. So now when we enter uh, n equal to two here, basically that's divide divides this energy here over four, which is then minus 3.4 electron volts. Okay. So note that this is a higher energy and not a lower energy despite well, the absolute value of the number is smaller and that's because of the negative algebraic sign, okay? So therefore the 2s and the 2p orbital have a higher energy than the 1s orbital, okay? But they are exactly the same, okay? So now as we go to the m shell, um, we have uh, three different kinds of orbits, the s, the p, and the d, but because energy is only a function of the quantum number n, they also have the same energy. We can also say they're energetically degenerate. Okay, the energy is then one ninth over E1, okay, because we enter the quantum number three here. Again, that's a higher energy than the other two energies because of the negative algebraic sign of E1. Okay, finally, we could also go to the fourth uh, shell, uh, we also call it the n shell. Then we have s, p, d, and f orbitals to consider, but they would all have the same energy. And the value of these energies would be 1 16th times the uh, uh, value for E1, which is minus 13.6 um, electron volts. Okay. Um, so I also want to mention why we choose electron volts as the energy unit. Um, it's nothing else but convenience, right? So 
the orbital energies are having very uh, are very small. So if we use this PSI unit uh, joule, we would have to deal all the time with very unhandy small um, numbers. And uh, for that simple reason, we give the energy in electron volt, which gives us nice handy numbers. And here is the exact um, conversion factor. So one electron volt is equal to 1.6021753 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Okay, so now we have basically fully described the uh, hydrogen atom. We know the possible electronic states um, of the electron in the hydrogen atom and we know also the associated energies with it. So now, what about multi-electron atoms, um, where we have more than one electron to consider? The most simple multi-electron atom would be the helium, where we would have two electrons to consider. So can we set up a Schrodinger equation uh, for this two electron problem as well? The answer is yes, we can. The trouble is that mathematically it becomes impossible to solve the equation. So therefore, all any electronic st structure associated with more than one electron must work with approximations, okay? Because you cannot find an exact mathematical solution for this problem anymore. It becomes mathematically or the, um, more, uh, too complex. Okay, so um, now what would what we expect for um, the energy of the electrons in the helium atom based on what we know for the, for the hydrogen atom? Okay. So for the hydrogen atom, we, we said um, that the energy of our electron in the one is R is minus 13.6 electron volt according to this equation here. So now for the helium atom, we have to consider that the two electrons now experience the Coulomb attraction from two protons instead of one proton, okay? Because there are now two protons in the nucleus. And therefore I would expect that the energy of the one S orbital is actually lower, okay? So now <clears throat> we can exactly calculate this and one would expect that the energy would be equal in general terms to minus Z square whereby z squared is simply the number of the protons times 20.6 electron volts over uh, n square. Okay. Um, now, in the case of the helium, z would simply be um, two. So it would be four times 13.6 electron volts over one square, okay, for the one s orbit. So now, um, according to that, the energy of a helium electron in the one s orbital should be minus 54.4 electron volts, okay? So now one can do this an experimental check if this is really true. And nearby, we are using the fact that the first ionization energy of the helium atom is minus the uh, orbital energy, okay? Because the ionization energy is the energy required to remove the electron 
from the 1s orbital. Okay. Therefore, it's a measure for, well, the binding energy of the electron, which is equal to the energy of the respective orbital, okay, just with the opposite algebraic sign. Okay. Remember, ionization energies are always positive because their endotherm requires energy to remove. But while the orbital energies are always negative because they represent the binding energy. So adding that electron back, okay, to the helium atom would be an exothermic process. So we can measure the ionization energy. And surprisingly, we would find that it's much lower. Okay, it's plus minus a uh, plus 24.6 electron volts, thus the associated uh, binding energy of the electron in the 1s orbital would be uh, just minus 24.6 electron volts, okay, which is much lower than minus 54.4 electron volts. On the other hand, if you take your helium plus ion, okay, and you remove the second electron, which is also in the 1s orbital, then you find exactly what you would expect, okay? 54.4 electron volts. Okay, so the second ionization energy is exactly what you would expect for the uh, uh, electron. Okay, so now what is the explanation for this? So the answer is, Shielding effects, and these shielding effects result essentially from electron electron repulsion. Okay, so what uh, this formula here doesn't consider is that not only the two electrons are being attracted uh, by, the, by the proton, the nucleus, but there's also um, electron electron repulsion between the electrons. And the electron electron repulsion increases the energy of the electrons in the Warner's orbit. Okay, the, the ionization energies are lower than expected. Okay, of course, that only applies when we actually have the two electrons in the helium atom. Okay, only then we can have electron electron repulsion once we have removed the first electron from the helium atom. Only one electron is left. And that left electron, of course, then behaves exactly according to this equation because no more electron electron interactions uh, are present. So we can view these electron electron interactions or repulsions also a little differently through what is called shielding effects. We can say that, well, the, the first electron in the helium atom shields away some of the nuclear charge from the second electron, okay? So therefore, the second electron uh, experiences only a reduced nuclear charge, which we can call also the effective nuclear charge. Okay, um, so for that reason, um, we can say now that um, the uh, real um, orbital energy for the first electron is being given by an effective nuclear charge, which is smaller than the real nuclear charge, which is two. And in this case, this is 1.34. Okay, one can calculate this value pretty easily. Um, so the following, by the following considerations, we can say that the energy of the electron is given by the effective, effective nuclear charge square over n square times 13.6 electron volts. And that matches the experimentally measured value of minus 24.6 electron volts. Remember, we measured that value via the ionization energy of the helium, first ionization energy of the helium, which was 24.6 electron volts. 
Okay, so then all I need to do is to is solve in this equation here for the effective nuclear charge. When you do this, then this is the effective nuclear charge the square root of n squared times 24.6 electron volts over 13.6 electron volts, which is when you enter one here and calculate 1.3. Okay, um, so now we have discussed the helium atom. Now let us go one step further and discuss the lithium atom, which now has three electrons. Okay, so now um, we cannot fit the third electron into the 1s orbital anymore because of the Pauli principle. Okay, remember the Pauli principle says that no two electrons in a single atom can have the same four quantum numbers. Okay, so that means when you have when you have two electrons in the same orbital, and see here the orbital an orbital represented by a box, then the spins of these two orbitals, uh, sorry, these two electrons must be must be opposite. Okay, they cannot be the same. Okay. And that a third electron would never fit into the same um, orbital because we have only two possibilities for the spin. So any additional electron must go into a different orbital. Okay, so that means that for the lithium atom that the one s orbitals are full with well the two electrons, and so the third electron must go into another orbital. Okay, so now when this lithium atom in the ground state, we would expect that it goes into the orbital with the next higher energy. Okay, that is in accordance with the Aufbau principle, which says that when our atoms are in the ground state, the electrons fill the orbitals with the lowest energy first, and only after that, the other uh, orbitals are being filled. So now we would need to uh, consider well uh, into which orbital would we fill our third electron. Okay. And according to the previous consideration that we did for the uh, hydrogen atom, we would actually have two possibilities, the 2s and the 2p. Remember for the hydrogen atom, we saw that um, the 2s and the 2p orbitals were degenerate because the energy only depended on the quantum number n. Okay, so now the question is, is that still true for a multi-electron atom with, um, for example, three electrons like the lithium atom? And the answer is no. For multi-electron atom, this degeneracy no longer holds true. And again, the reasons are shielding effects, which are due to electron-electron interactions. Okay, so in fact, um, the 2s orbital is actually slightly lower in energy than the 2p orbital. Okay, so for that reason, um, our third electron goes into the 2s and the electron configuration, ground state electron configuration of lithium is 1s2, 2s1. So now, how can we understand that the 2s orbital has a slightly lower energy than the 2p orbital? And you can understand this uh, via this graph here. You see in this graph that we have the radial probability plotted of the different orbitals, plotted as a function of the distance from the nucleus. So you see here that the 1s orbital is of course closest to the nucleus. Okay. Now the 2p orbital is shown here and has one maximum, and the 2s orbital here in green has two maxima. So you see actually that the that the large maximum of the 2s is slightly further away than this large maximum of the 2p. Okay. However, 
the 2s also has this more maximum here very close to the nucleus and for that reason the 2s orbital overall penetrates the 1s orbital slightly better than the 2p orbital okay so for that reason the 1s orbital shields slightly less okay the electrons of a 2s in comparison of a 2p and for that reason the 2s orbital has a slightly lower energy than the 2p okay so we can now generalize these considerations um, for um, other orbitals so generally when we have electrons in the same shell then the energy of these orbitals increase with increasing quantum number l okay so an an S would have a lower energy than an P, which is a lower energy than an ND, which is a lower energy than an NF, okay, for the same quantum number N. Okay. So that is because the penetrating ability, okay, of an S orbital is larger than that of a P orbital, which is larger than that of a D orbital, which is larger than that of an F orbital. Okay. So because of that reason, well, the effective nuclear charge on an S electron is greater than that on a P electron than that on a D electron compared to that of an F electron. And that explains why the energy of these orbitals is in that order. Okay, so here is just one example. So we have here the orbitals of the third shell, the 3s, the 3p, and the 3d. And well, for the hydrogen atom, they would all have the same energy, but for a multi-electron atom, this energy is not the same anymore. So the 3s has the lowest energy, and that's the energy of the 3p, and then there's the energy of the 3d. Okay. So now, of course, it would be very useful if you could um, calculate the energies of these orbitals in multi-electron atom in, his, in, a, in a simple manner using the con concept of the effective nuclear charge. Okay, and uh, a quite elegant um, way to estimate. Okay. the orbital energies using the concept of the electric, uh, effective nuclear charge are the so-called Slater rules. So the Slater rules calculate a so-called shielding constant, which is then subtracted from the real nuclear charge to give the effective nuclear charge. Okay, so now the Slater rules basically estimate what uh, is that shielding constant for a particular electron of consideration. So the Slater rules uh, work the following way. So in the first step, you write out the electron configuration of the atom. Okay. Um, and you write the electron configurations according to quantum numbers. Okay, starting from the lowest quantum numbers, going to the highest quantum numbers. Okay, so this does not, by the way, follow exactly the energy of these orbitals. Okay, um, so we have well, first the 1s, then we have the 2s, then the 2p, then the 3s, then the 3p, then the 3d, then the 4s, and the 4p, and the 4d, the 4f, the 5s, and the 5p, and so forth. Okay, so then we actually place parentheses around orbitals which have approximately um, the same energy and these are always s and p orbitals that have the same quantum number n so you see that the 2s and the 2p have it, are in one group the 3s and the 3p are in one group the 4s and the 4p are in one group and so forth okay 
the one s stands separate because there's no one p orbital and the d and the f orbitals also always are their own group um, according to the Slater rules. So then in the next step, we estimate um, contributions to the shielding constant for an electron of consideration, whereby we distinguish basically between uh, S and P electrons and D and F electrons on the other side. So let us first consider the rules for S and P electrons. Okay, so we are looking at an S or a P electron for which we want to calculate the effective nuclear charge. <coughs> so, um, so the first rule is that electrons to the right of um, the electron of consideration, either the S or P electron, contribute nothing to the shielding constant. Okay? And it's easily understandable because these electrons are further away from the nucleus compared to the electron under consideration. Therefore, we would understand that these electrons would not shield any effective nuclear charge. Okay. So then um, each of the other electrons in the same group contribute 0.35, a factor of 0.35 to sigma, okay? So they do not fully shield an elementary charge, but approximately 35% or a factor of 0.35 of a full elementary charge, okay? That is because they are in a similar distance from the nucleus compared to the electron of consideration. So now the third rule says that each electron in an n minus one shell contributes 0.85 to sigma. Okay, so these electrons are already considerably closer to the nucleus than the electron of consideration. Therefore, they can shield significantly better by a factor of 0.85 or 85 percent of a full, nuclear, a full elementary charge. And any electron in an n minus one shell contributes by a factor of 1.0, so they practically fully uh, shield an entire elementary charge. Okay, so these are the rules for um, S and P electrons. So rules for B and F electrons are similar. They are actually a little bit simpler. So again, electrons to the right of that D or F electron contribute nothing to the shielding because they're further away. Then electrons in the same group contribute 0.35 to the shielding. And each electron left to that group contributes one to the shielding. So let us apply this later rules in a number of examples and uh, see if they can estimate orbital energies well and also can explain the Aufbau principle and electron configuration, particular ground state electron configurations of multi-electron atoms. Okay, so for instance, we can take our oxygen atom and ask, well, what's the effective nuclear charge for a P electron of oxygen? And now our electron of, of consideration is a P electron of the oxygen. So first we have to be clear about the electron configuration of the oxygen and write that electron configuration according to Slater, which would in this case be 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, and the S electrons would be in their own group and the S and the P electrons would represent another, okay? So now we put ourselves on one of the four P electrons to calculate the shielding of all the other electrons. So we can do this by applying this Slater rules. 
So um, the effective nuclear charge will be the real nuclear charge minus the shielding constant. So the real nuclear charge of the oxygen is eight because we have eight protons to consider. So what is the shielding constant? Well, we see that we have um, no electron right to the p electron of consideration. We have overall five electrons in the same group, okay? Why it's five? Because it's six minus the one that we consider. We never count that, okay? So those contribute by a factor of 0 0.35. So then we still have to consider the shielding of the uh, two. One is orbitals. So they are in an N minus one group. Therefore, they contribute by a factor of 0 0.85. Okay, we have two of them. So we add their contribution to the contribution of the S and the P. Well, this value we subtract from eight and that gives our effective nuclear charge, which is 4.55. Okay. We could ask the same question for the one S electron of oxygen. So what would that be? Well, in this case, we would put ourselves on one of these two. Then all these to the right, the S and the P, wouldn't contribute in any way. We'd only need to consider the other one S, which would, con which would contribute 0 0.35. Okay. So overall, the effective nuclear charge would be 8 minus 0 0.35. Five, which would be 7.65. Yeah. So we see here that the effective nuclear charge on a 1s electron is significantly higher than the effective nuclear charge of p electrons. That also makes perfect sense because we know that the 1s electron is much closer to the nucleus in comparison to the uh, 2p electron. All right, um, now we can also explain the electron configuration of more complex atoms like the um, potassium atom. So we know that for the potassium atom, the real electron configuration is one is two, two is according to energy, is one is two, two is two, two P six, three is two, three P six, four is one, Okay, so we have a 4s valence electron, okay, and not, as you might suspect, a 3d electron. Okay, so obviously the energy of that electron must be lower than that, but would our Slater rules actually be able to predict that, thereby um, exp explaining that? that electron electron configuration of the potassium? And uh, the answer is um, yes. So um, the shielding constant for the uh, first electron configuration is just 18 times one, okay? That is because in the same group, we have only one electron. So all the other electrons are in an n minus one or lower shell. We apply the rules for p electrons and so forth. Therefore, all these 18 electrons <clears throat> fully contribute. Okay. And then the effective nuclear charge is just 19 minus 18 is equal to what? So 19 is the real nuclear charge, 18 is the shielding constant, and the effective nuclear charge would be one. Okay, so now um, for the other electron configuration, we would have here this 4s electron to consider. So in this case, um, we would have 10 electrons in an n minus one shell. Um, it was, oh, sorry, eight electrons in an n minus one shell. So these are the 3p and the 3s, they would contribute 0 0.85. And all the other 10 
these six, these two, and these two would contribute one. So the shielding constant would therefore be 16.8. And for that reason, the effective nuclear charge would be 2.2. So we see already that the effective nuclear charge of, on the 4S is um, significantly higher than on the 3D, which would argue that uh, the 4S is bound more strongly than the 3D and therefore having a lower energy explaining the L configuration. The answer is yes. Um, you can also calculate the energy explicitly. Okay, so for the 3D, the energy of our 3D electron would be minus once um, square, so that's the effective nuclear charge here, times 13.6 electron volts over n square, okay, so the quantum number n is equal to three, therefore we have three square, and that would give minus 1.51 electron volts. So now we can do the same also for the 4s, and then it would have minus 2.2 square times 13.6 six electron volts over four square, which would give minus 4.14 electron volts, okay? So that energy here is lower than that, which explains why this electron configuration is the ground state electron configuration, not the electron configuration with a 3D valence filter. Okay, then let's stop at this point here.